They say that the definition of insanity is to repeat the same process over and over again with the expectation of getting different results. If, however, these same repetitions were done so in a world where the results can only ever be the same, where you're trapped inside an eternal loop, like the Ouroboros infinitely eating its own tail, what could we call such a place, aside from our own personal circles of hell? Like a glitch embedded in the mind from a trauma, you're condemned to continue a narrative without realizing the spiral you've fallen into, split like a seesaw between the past and the future, trapped in the present of your own perpetual deja vu. For better or worse, Playdead's Limbo was the first video game in my experience to truly showcase the medium as a legitimate form of art, where the foreboding atmosphere, chilling detail and mise-en-scene, not to mention the overall feel of the game, took precedence over the gameplay itself to create an experience I for one have never truly been able to shake off. It's a game that has lived inside of me ever since I played it, which is well over a decade ago now. Whilst it feels somewhat strange to be discussing it all these years later, it is precisely this reason again why the game feels like more than a game, and one where the horror of art is no better or more beautifully depicted. Now you might be asking, what do I mean by the horror of art? And in truth, I'm not entirely sure myself, or perhaps it is an admission I'd prefer to avoid. But like the definition of insanity and the thin line between genius and madness, with the two so often being indistinguishable, I believe there's a crossover and perhaps correlation when it comes to the notion of horror, certainly so in the existential sense, and that of art as a whole. For instance, what even is art? Art is man's attempt to control and dominate the chaos of nature. It is the futile yet irresistible attempt to stop it in its tracks, to understand its mechanisms through depiction and to suspend its unceasing state of flux into something everlasting yet unchanging. An impossible feat in all reality, but one our own natures have us inexplicably drawn to. In this video I'd like to take you on an exploration into the world of Limbo and why the game stays with you long after completing it. The reason it is more art than game is because of the ambiguity of its storytelling, or perhaps lack thereof, and how that crosses over with our own experiences of life, and not, I'm afraid, in the particularly pleasant sense. Taking several theories and pitting them against one another, I hope to explain, given its multifaceted narrative, how Limbo combines a hellish cocktail of abuse, death, mental illness, death, trauma, death, loneliness, death, isolation, death, loss, and, lest we forget, death. To create an experience that not only never leaves you, but that also haunts you, and always has. With all this in mind, my aim is to prove that Limbo is much more than a game, and something very few creative endeavors manage to accomplish. That being, and it should go without saying really by this point, it is a work of art.
Am I also implying that with every piece of genuine art, a horror lurks within its very core, and perhaps even beyond its creation? Let's find out. Given the title, Playdead's Limbo signals not its ending or beginning, but that there is no ending or beginning. It's a perpetual liminal space, with a platform design that quite brilliantly plays homage to the 2D classics of Super Mario Bros. and Sonic the Hedgehog, to name but a few, whilst at the same time feeling like it belongs to a parallel universe. Instead of an assortment of colours, our world is black and white. Where an upbeat, encouraging soundtrack once was, we're trapped in a land of monotonous, though equally mesmerising, unnerving drones. Rather than bouncy foley sounds that increase our enjoyment, we're hosted to an array of critter noises and mechanical sounds that only provoke our dread, from the buzzing of flies to the shrilled spring of a bear trap. And that's just for starters. Instead of baddies to kill, coins to collect and upgrades to be earned, we are the one to be repeatedly killed, there's diddly squat to collect, and not an iota of upgrades to be had. The genius behind the art that is Limbo then is, therefore, born out of a distinct horror, a certain oddity, a sense that it doesn't quite belong. What we're left with is the feeling that any progress made is futile, and yet the need to continue is out of our control. The perpetual liminal space mentioned before also reminds one of dreaming too, with an uncanny sense of unshakable deja vu. You're just there, like in a dream, with no idea how it began, and the nightmarish inkling that you'll never reach its end. If indeed, it even has one. Since we're human, all too human, we'll start at the so-called beginning, but with the different theoretical narratives in play. Before we quote-unquote begin, however, let's rewind. At the start of this video, I took on a rather negative viewpoint on the concept of repetition. A notion that I'd like to briefly counter before we get into the game, so to speak. For it is also my belief that repetition or routine does also come with a host of benefits. From the development of skills into mastery, to the comfort of the familiar too. In fact, the repeating of a process could be conceived of as a necessary evil when it comes to acquiring mastery of any kind. With this in mind, I'm reminded of what Picasso once said, learn the rules like a pro, so you could break them like an artist. With the concept of such painstakingly repetitive behavior, however, the saying takes on a more ambiguous, even unnerving tone. To elaborate, it appears to suggest that the acquisition of the skill will grant you the freedom of an artist, but it seems to me that the liberty awarded is still dependent on the rules and thus is actually more of an entrapment than emancipation. Or perhaps that one is dependent on the other and vice versa. If there is a point to this video, it is to be found here. But I'll let our poor friend Sisyphus explain that a little later. The difference, however, in the acquisition of skills as opposed to a repeated behaviour is of course that the former is done with a goal in mind. Whilst a repeated pattern, it is done so with the intention of improvement. The mindlessness of day-to-day -day habits, usually performed unconsciously, are the components that make up the entangling trap, or spider's web, of routine. 
The comfort of the familiar is another rabbit hole we each fall into on what I feel is a fairly regular basis. The mere fact that Friends is still talked about and referenced to, not to mention routinely watched by millions of people worldwide, pretty much proves my point. I suppose we each need to find comfort in this world in whichever way we can, but I can't help theorising that this willing exposure to the same thing, knowing it won't come with any surprises, or in fact, anything new, is an act of self infantilization We willingly plug ourselves into a screen the same way we were once attached to our mother's umbilical cord. Which I guess brings me back to the child of our video game, whom is representative of the inner child we each carry around with us, regardless of our age. As we progress through the story, I'll be keeping the following theories surrounding the game in mind, in what are a mixture of some of my favourites, others that I personally do not agree with, and a few of my own. Please refer to the links in the description to get an inkling as to my sources. And for those interested, there are a fair few theories out there that I would have liked to include had I had the time, but I live in the illusion of a linear-based time frame so some simply didn't make the cut. Thank you. The first is of how Limbo is a story of a recently deceased man being taken back to the time he was a child and how he is in Limbo to right some wrong. The second theory is of Limbo's protagonist actually being not as innocent as his big, bright, white eyes appear to suggest, making him the antagonist of the story. The third is of how the boy's journey is somewhat like an allegory for human history itself, giving us an overview of our evolution and throwing us into the Industrial Age, somewhere between the First and Second World War. The fourth, and in what is my theory, is how the game is not only a combination of all the above, but also a metaphor for the impact of trauma and the cerebral Ouroboros it breeds, where the root of many a mental disorder is planted. The fifth and final one is how the journey of Limbo is symbolic to that of life itself, with all of its sufferings, trials and tribulations, and the unending, ultimately futile search for some kind of meaning. Or it's just your run of the mill, paint by number, does what it says on the tin 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 colour story. And all of these theories are just the natural reaction of our narrative obsessed species trying to make sense of that which it cannot fathom. Which is probably the real limbo we've all been subjected to as a species when you really come to think about it. Think about it. Think about it. But let's just leave that for another day, shall we? Whilst the temptation to summarise the story is palpable, I have to assume, given the title of this video, that those who clicked it have already played the game, and therefore retelling the story would only be telling you what you already know. And, as already mentioned in the segment, the one where that sitcom got a totally unnecessary shout out, this is not an episode of Friends. Though, especially with the theory of Limbo on the agenda, the irony is difficult to resist. Anyway, without further ado, let us begin. The only tagline ascribed to the game goes as follows. Uncertain of his sister's fate, a boy enters limbo. I've always wondered what theories would have surrounded the game if it had simply released without any headline at all. Would we presume the girl the boy is following is his sister, or more, his crush? Maybe even just a friend? But what it does highlight is the boy's uncertainty as to the well-being of his sister. Not 
decidedly, to himself. Some hypotheses claim that a young child's relationship to his or her sibling to be the closest relationship they'll ever have, assuming the age gap doesn't extend the standard handful of years. With this in mind, the raison d'etre for our protagonist is precisely that of his entire being itself. Without his sister, he does not know who he is, so the seemingly mindless quest has a clear, justifiable goal. Find your sister. That's all you have to do. For without her, there is no you. Deprived of the knowledge that the girl is your sister, or indeed anyone related to you though, you'll play up to the first hour or so of the game without any clue as to her significance. And even when you do, it isn't clear that you're there to help her, or that she's there to save you. Before then, you are alone. Waking in the woods, you're left to wonder not only where you are, but also how you got there. Without any means as to an answer though, the only option you have is to move forward. Trekking from left to right only inflicts a further sense of uncertainty. For pretty soon, it is made quite clear that this world is not a welcoming one. In a matter of minutes, instead of wondering just where the hell you are, you're wondering how the hell you can get out of there. In essence, the only story that has been told thus far is the one you've extrapolated from your environment. This place is not safe. Move. Scared and now self-conscious, the boy soon realises that he's in a world of creepy crawlies that, be it through his imagination or not, are much bigger than him, indicating not only how this world is a feral and threatening one, but also one largely out of his control. This lends itself to not only many a childhood fear, but also one of our own evolution. During the Carboniferous period in the late Paleozoic era, around 315 million years ago, arachnids and dragonflies grew in feet, not inches. And while the insects of Limbo vary somewhat in this regard, it is interesting to note that regardless of size, insects still succeed in raising our threat responses. Obviously, the Goliath insects were around long before human beings ever showed up, but it is a wonder why we see them as if they are the same sizes they once were. Almost as if, somehow, we were genetically predisposed to magnify them in our mind's eye to the sizes they once possessed, long before we were even close to existence ourselves. Returning to our realm of limbo though, all the boy is left to do is manipulate that which he can, from bear traps oddly placed about the ground, which I'll get to in just a minute, to other contraptions that you'll no doubt be killed by innumerable times throughout your journey, to boxes and rope and the like. Curiously, it is at this moment early in the game where the protagonist could also be accused of being the antagonist. To get to wherever it is he is going, the boy disturbs the peace of the leviathan spider by mercilessly severing off one of its legs in order to progress. Later too, upon being seen by the other kids in this limbo of the infants, their Lord of the Flies-esque reaction is only exercised when the child gets too close. Who is to say that he isn't the enemy of this strange landscape? Who could claim that the reason his sister finds herself in limbo isn't because he killed her himself, whether by accident or otherwise? This earlier period in the game is littered with pits full of spikes and deadly falls. Even the small pools of water offer their own threat. At first, I thought of this as possibly the only flaw in the game, as the boy drowns in a matter of seconds. Upon reflection, however, 
It is very unlikely that the kid would be able to swim given his presumed age and is therefore stricken with panic any time he comes into contact with water, thus drowning in an instant. The darkness surrounding him is also a threat, often causing the player to panic jump when uncertain, throwing our hero into certain death, which, what with darkness being representative of death itself, is precisely what it wanted us to do. Another theory depicts how the game is largely about fear. As a child, we fear insects, darkness, disease, bugs, bullying, fighting and the like. Notice too how the children use spears and fire to attack the boy, another indicator of our hunter-gatherer history as a species. The bear traps placed at the beginning and sporadically throughout, whilst a relatively modern invention by comparison, could have also been pilfered from the industrial period stage of the game that we're headed towards too, perhaps by Piggy and Friends. Though these speculations lend themselves to the extreme, it is the world of Limbo and all its ambiguity that breeds them. We know as little about the world and its mechanisms from the start as we do at the end, which really, what with it being called Limbo, is precisely the point. Some other theories state that the game is not with hidden meaning at all, that what you see is what you get. But seeing as the game not only shifts from a forest-based landscape to an industrialized human one, but also flips its own physics on its head, this surface level assertion doesn't quite hold up. At the same time, however, it does. We are the ones in want of extrapolating meaning from this world, but do we get to choose this desire? Or are we simply at the mercy of it? Feeling out of control and helpless goes from being an emotional response to a literal one too. During a brief encounter with a murder of crows, the boy has a strange parasitic egg planted inside his head. Play Dead quite beautifully foreshadows their second outing of inside with this part of the game, sending the boy out to aimlessly wander left or right without you being able to stop him and only changing direction when exposed to a singular bright ray of light. Somewhat strangely, the only way to rid yourself of the bug is to feed it back to the crows too, as if being a part of you is what's really being consumed. <laughs> Going back to the notion of nature, or natural world if you will, parasites manipulate the cognitive functioning of their hosts in a myriad of bizarre and strange ways, ranging from suicidality, sociality, bodyguarding, or offspring care, and spontaneity, decision-making, to name but a few. Taking from the first mentioned of suicidal behaviour, some worms induce crickets and other terrestrial insects to commit suicide in water, enabling the exit of the parasite into an aquatic environment favourable to its reproduction. In another example of behavioural manipulation, Ants that consume the secretions of a caterpillar containing dopamine are less likely to move away from the caterpillar and more likely to be aggressive. In all likelihood, the behavioural change to the boy in limbo is that of suicidality, since without your guidance, the boy is headed toward a most certain death. In my assertion, this would likely be by drowning, given that water is a predominant component of the world. Perhaps the crow is also tricked into thinking that the boy is dead and thus eats the worm slash egg, believing that the parasite has been successfully replanted into a new host. Or perhaps the residue of said parasite remains inside its own head and is thus consuming its own young without realizing it. Given that we are playing as a child in a big bad scary forest too, I'm also inclined to mention that birds such as this are often characters featured in the earliest fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. In Cinderella, originally known as Ash Poodle, the sweet avian acquaintances of our lead girl turn into the most bloodthirsty of redemptive villains by the end of the story, 
pecking out the eyes of the stepsisters as punishment for their deception. And that's after they both sliced off parts of their feet just to squeeze their foot into the slipper. The macabre nature of these tales is easily echoed by Playdead's limbo, if not outdone by it. And on more than one occasion, a correlation can definitely be found between the two. After all, bedtime stories would likely have been a part of this boy's life before death. And with one of the theories of Limbo being about a man looking back on his life after death, or one of some traumatic event, the world could be shaped largely by the perspective of our protagonist. When the world spirals out of control and flips its physics on its head, for example, could be indicative of the state the child felt leading up to a cataclysmic event. Many adhere to the theory that the boy died in a car crash and how that is emulated at the quote-unquote ending slash beginning. As people have testified, being a part of a car crash seems to slow down time, making it feel as if the world is travelling at a snail's pace of its default speed, where angles and positions lose all sense of meaning in the brief kaleidoscope of distorted gravity just before a crash. When a person with a genuine mental disorder comes close to resolving their issue, instead of feeling relief, there's often the notion of feeling more like your life is under threat. Given that the narrative adopted by said person was once there to preserve and protect their life, this feeling as if they're about to die is a most genuine one. It is a quite literal, life-threatening event. And like the parasite mentioned earlier, self-preservation seemingly works just as much for mental disorders too. In storytelling or writing books, this threat is sometimes referred to as the lie. During the hero's journey arc, at some point in the narrative, usually just before the conclusive segment, our protagonist, having had their incorrect belief previously challenged multiple times throughout the story, will have to confront and accept that the lie that once served them, for better or worse, is exactly that. Simply not true. They will normally put up as much resistance as possible before accepting this fact, much like any species, parasite, mental illness, or system of belief will do, in the face of certain extinction. One theory I read, which I think is a little bit of a stretch but still fun to entertain nonetheless, is that the slug-like entities are actually metaphors for the indoctrination a child will face and be put under only a few short years, if not from birth, via their parents, surroundings, and perhaps most pointedly, the education system. It trains you, not on how to think, but on what to think instead, robbing you of your own viewpoint and impressions a lot like being led by a force that tricks you into thinking you're the one in charge. Another concept I haven't heard mentioned in any other theory out there is the relationship Limbo has with that of Deja Vu, which is perhaps just as odd as the feeling it elicits whenever the already seen takes place. Imagine if you were caught in a perpetual liminal space, a place with no beginning or ending. Now let's consider what the scientific explanation of deja vu really is. There isn't one, not at least in the empirical sense. Many theories surround the strange phenomenon, most of them dealing with memory where the short term overlap with the long term, causing the affected person to experience the dizzying feeling of having already lived the present moment a time before. Just to be clear, I do not have any faith that this is indicative of any previous life nonsense, but I cannot help but feel unnerved whenever I'm struck by the sensation. <laughs> 
I imagine this is because I've experienced the oddity of deja vu during singular, some would say traumatizing times. For instance, I was struck by the feeling to the point of near collapse when I discovered that an old friend from school had committed suicide and when an ex-girlfriend told me she was abused as a child. And another time too, when I was quote-unquote going out with a tomboyish girl at around the age of 13, the details of which I shall go into now. For the first and what turned out to be the last time I ever visited her house, I was deeply unnerved by the cold, ominous atmosphere of the place. The seeming lack of sound, a certain coldness emanating from the walls, the lack of decor, an amalgamation of dust coated over everything like a thin veil of ice. I liken it also to the feeling of seeing condensation leave your breath, only when in the household you could just sense it internally, as if the external wouldn't allow it to be seen. I don't recall us speaking much, though now that I mention it, I am reminded of the girl telling me, oddly enough, that she had had an hour-long telephone conversation the day before with a mutual male friend, the same friend who would later go on to commit suicide. Aside from that, the girl and I just kissed, the odd smack of saliva ricocheting about the walls in sporadic, awkward echoes. I learned shortly after this visit that a year before, the girl's dad had died. That, to my young mind at least, explained why the mother hadn't left her room to say hi, introduce herself, or anything of the sort. In fact, she'd simply call out the girl's name if she wanted to speak to her from within the confines of her own room. The tone of her muffles sounded exhausted making the brief exchanges between mother and daughter seemingly played out a thousand times before, never once deviating from the inflection of their voices or the emotions they induced. Nothing but a repeated series of events. She never once opened the door. Around a fortnight later, the girl was meant to be taking a vacation somewhere. I forget where, but I was surprised to go into school on the Monday morning, only to see that the girl was in attendance. Confused, I asked, What are you doing here? After an awkward hello. Why aren't you on holiday? Without a second's hesitation, she replied, My mum died last night. Emptily, bereft of any emotion, like it was a throwaway line or the verbalization of a nonchalant shrug. I can't remember if I replied. I probably, or at least I'd like to believe, apologized, then hugged her, amused by not only her response, but also why someone had allowed her to attend school, considering the circumstances. When I arrived home, I distinctly remember collapsing on the second sofa as my mother asked me how my day was, which is something she seldom did. I explained what had happened and whilst doing so, I was struck by an overwhelming, incomprehensible rush of deja vu, which brought me to tears that I could not control, as if I were being suffocated by them. Perhaps there is a linkage, at least in the makeup of my own mind, 
that strikes me with deja vu whenever I'm unable to process information or emotions such as the ones arisen by moments like these. I do not know. Quite often, the memories of these incidents are recalled in third person, as if I'm outside of my own body and mind, looking in, dissociated, glaring at a stranger who doesn't quite understand the feelings he's being struck by. I believe that's why I'm so unnerved by the feelings solicited by Deja Vu. Whilst I cannot entertain the notion of it being part of a past life or anything like that, I still can't help being riddled with anxiety by its impact. The only other time I've been reminded of the notion outside of the experience itself was during the first season of True Detective, where Rust Cole talked about the eerie idea or theory that time is a flat circle and how everything we've ever done will be repeated ad infinitum in the horror version of Nietzsche's eternal return model. Nature and the great, terrifying secrets of the universe being nothing but a limbo, forever recycling itself for a mere repetition of the exact same thing. When you consider how nature essentially consumes itself in order to propagate its existence, it does make you wonder. What if deja vu is the rule rather than the anomaly? The sense of the infinite everything. Not only does it leave you utterly helpless as to when it'll occur, and what events will incite it, but it also carries with it the slight notion that it's always been out of your control before you or I or any of us were even born. Written in the stars we gaze up to at night, stars of which, due to the distance and travelling speed of light, are in fact no longer there. I'm also under the impression, be it as deluded or metaphorical as it may be, that each time one of these events occurs, you're never the same person again. Life, especially the longer it goes on, is a series of decay, after all, where, much like in Limbo, you die over and over and over again, spiritually psychologically, physically, emotionally, cognitively, and finally, one day, quite literally. But if you think that's bad, let's bring poor old Sisyphus in to make us feel that little bit better. At first, I was a little reluctant to bring in this concept of the absurd, due to its tired cliché when it comes to the philosophy of existentialism. Hopefully, however, we can give it a new spin. As mentioned, one theory places the era of Limbo to be somewhere between the First and Second World Wars. This is mainly due to the industrial landscape we eventually find ourselves in, but also the appearance of these guns which do indeed look a lot like the artillery weapons utilised during both. What this has to do with Sisyphus I'll get to in a minute, but returning to the theory that Limbo is a story about a man, having grown old and died, looking back on an event of his life, could be supported further here by the factory-esque foundations and mechanical mise-en-scene we are forever trying to escape. This could either be indicative of what the child, or the man as a child, was exposed to during the time, like the possibility that he once saw one of the factories in operation due to a parental figure, and thus instilling a very understandable fear of such a place, or that the man himself worked in one during his lifetime. And, not to mention, the social anxiety of impending war. <laughs> 
We must laugh in the face of our helplessness against the forces of nature or go insane. Charlie Chaplin Released in 1936, a mere few years before World War II, Charlie Chaplin documented the absurdity of the workplace and the monotonous nature of the assembly line in comedic fashion with the film Modern Times, quite literally diving into its inner mechanisms to further illustrate its merry-go-round madness. Six years later, and during the Second World War, Albert Camus published the closely related The Stranger and The Myth of Sisyphus. The former, a far superior expression of the metaphor or concept of the latter, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll stick with said latter, at least for now. Having, funnily enough, found himself punished for not accepting death when his time came, Sisyphus was condemned by the underworld gods into a quote-unquote life where his only desire would surely be death, and death by the quickest means imaginable. His punishment being, for those unawares, or indeed those living under a rock, to push a boulder up a mountain top, only for it to roll down the other side when he reached the summit, requiring him to repeat the process ad infinitum. In a lot of ways, the purgatorial horror of this kind of treatment is not only echoed by the factory line workers of the time of its release, but is also portrayed by science fiction of recent times too. How often, for example, has a Black Mirror episode ended where its protagonist, whether knowingly so or not, has found his or herself inside a limbo of somebody else's making, forcing them to repeatedly live through their own worst nightmare. Some might argue that the point of Sisyphus is not to do with the horrific circumstances in which he finds himself in though, but rather the way in which Camus interpreted him as the absurd hero. It is my belief that many of us, if not all, if we were to be honest, confront the absurdity of existence during frequent periods of our lives, if not in their entirety. Not only with the repetitiveness of our careers, but also with our behaviours and habits to boot. The sheer pointlessness and meaninglessness of it all is, however, a liberating one and perhaps the greatest underappreciated element of our indifferent universe. To stare in the face of our hopelessness is to eradicate the ludicrous notion of hope in the first place. Or, as better demonstrated by the closing thoughts of Merceau in Camus' The Stranger, and I felt ready to live it all again too, as if the blind rage had washed me clean, rid me of hope, for the first time in that night alive with signs and stars, I opened myself to the gentle indifference of the world, finding it so much like myself, so like a brother, really. I felt I had been happy and that I was happy again. For everything to be consummated, for me to feel less alone, I had only to wish that there be a large crowd of spectators the day of my execution and that they greet me with cries of hate. Why hate, you may ask? For Masseau now accepts and sees that which is refused to be seen or even acknowledged by the maddening crowd, all of whom are deriving some sort of perverse enjoyment for his upcoming demise. Despite the knowledge deep down in their core, that each and every single one of them shares Masseau's fate. As we briefly touched upon the universe, I'd be remiss not to at least dabble in the final stages of the game, 
where gravity can be flipped at the quite literal switch of a button, but also where the mechanics turn in such a way as to mimic not only the industrialized section of the game, but also mirror the very notion of limbo itself. For if we are to be trapped in a liminal space, who is to say where it begins or ends, if we can even entertain the concept of either in such a place? How this relates to outer space or the universe as a whole may be a bit of a stretch, but the linger of dread aroused by a few discoveries in the realm of quantum mechanics at least feels as if they're cut from the same cloth. Take, for instance, the double slit experiment. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Like with many experiments when it comes to quantum mechanics, oddity is at its core. In layman's terms, the double slit experiment involves the passing of waves through two narrow and parallel slits and how they'll form a pattern of interference on a screen. However, light isn't merely a wave. It's also a particle known as a photon. And contrary to belief, when you shoot a single photon at the double slits, an interference pattern will still emerge, despite there only being one, as if the photon travels through both slits at the same time. Just to add to this bizarreness, the simple observation of the experiment also alters the behavior of the photon, or photons, since they are both single and plural in theory here, as well. The basic idea behind the experiment is that even if the photons are sent through the slits individually, a wave is still present to produce the interference, known as a wave of probability. This is because the experiment is set up as such so that the scientists have no idea which of the two slits any photon will pass through. When they've tried to discover which is moving through which, via detectors set up in front of the slits, no interference pattern shows up at all. This, remarkably, still occurs even when the detectors are set up behind the slits. Whether in front or behind, any attempt to observe the photons results in the pattern of interferences, lack of emergence. And if that wasn't strange enough, a variation of the experiment to determine what exactly is happening here was designed, labelled the delayed choice experiment. Using specialised crystals placed at each slit, Scientists predicted that any incoming photons would be split by the crystal, making a pair of identical ones. Assumedly, one photon of the two would go on to create the interference pattern previously unseen, whilst the other would be picked up by the detector. In essence, the doubling up of the double slit experiment was set up to circumvent its apparent lack of activity in a peripheral version of peeking through the looking glass, if you will. Perhaps through making the photon split via the crystals as they passed through the slit, physicists could determine what exactly the photons were getting up to. But even more bafflingly, it still doesn't work, regardless of when any sort of detection occurs. Even if the second photon is detected after the first photon hits the screen, it still ruins the interference pattern. This means, and just try and wrap your head around this, that the observation of a photon can alter events that have already occurred. It's as if the metaphysical world operates on a plane of liminal spaces with neither a beginning nor an end where déjà vu exists independent of time, like it's a finite though ever-expanding realm. Sort of like a flattened circle, where everything that will happen has already occurred and will continue to do so forever. An ad infinitum eternal return. Something akin to limbo.
Wouldn't you agree? Finally, and to try and end this on a somewhat neutral point, in theory at least, I feel that the boy in limbo is the symbol for the lost child in all of us. Similar in the way that we can never truly know ourselves or what drives us, being subject to the follies of the subconscious as we are during our lifetimes. The child in us, no matter how beaten down, abandoned and seemingly phantasmagoric, lives on in all of us, seen only in our shadows, as clueless to the world and its reason for being here as he or she always was and always will be, where he or she waits for an answer to a question they'll never know how to ask. And somehow, Limbo combines all of the above to portray one of the key components of the human condition, making it a profound piece of art, as it works like a mirror, exposing our need for story rather than desire for it. For we can only make sense of the situation we find ourselves in by breaking the universe down into what we consider comprehensible all whilst non-existent outside of our collective and subjective viewpoints. And, as the boy would surely testify to, you cannot be struck by the awe-inspiring nature of existence without its distinct residue of profound horror. Thank you for watching, though who knows how many times you've already seen this before. In all likelihood, this was not your first time.